This video has been made possible thanks to Masterworks. Skip Masterworks waiting list by clicking on the link in the description. More about this in a bit. I thought we would never live through a war in the middle of the 21st century. How is this even possible? I know, I know. Everyone has said this at some point in the last few weeks. Everyone thought that wars were a thing of the past. It seemed that John Lennon's pacifist spirit had possessed all of us Europeans, including Vladimir Putin. But remember, John Lennon always meets Yoko Ono. And the European Yoko Ono moment was the invasion of Ukraine. Suddenly, the anti-military consensus of the European Union has disappeared. We are entering a new era with stories like this one. Germany to boost military spending in latest historic shift. Virtually all European governments are making similar announcements. And yes, this is a massive shift in the European Union. Europe has been spending too little money on defense for decades. And when I say too little money, I mean less than it should have under NATO agreements. According to NATO's founding charter, all member states should spend at least 2% of their GDP on security. However, look at this map. The countries shown in red are those that do not comply with NATO commitments. As you can see, with the exception of France, Poland and a few others, almost no country has fulfilled their obligation. And this has been the case for almost 30 years. In case anyone was wondering, the coronavirus has nothing to do with this. After the fall of the Iron Curtain, all European countries have reduced their defence budgets year after year. The conclusion? Europe might have problems deterring, for example, a possible attack from Russia. Or so it was thought. Because as we are seeing in Ukraine, the point is that all of this explains why Vladimir Putin dared to invade Ukraine while expecting Europe to stand idly by and watch. So the question now is, where is all the money going to come from to finance this new military spending? Could this be a golden opportunity for European companies? To what extent could Putin's threats be the unique opportunity for Europe to break into slide into stagnation? Today, we're going to answer all of these questions. But first, we have a surprise for you. And this is all thanks to our sponsor, Masterworks. Here on Visual Politic, we believe it is super important to stay informed. This implies to everything from the political issues around the world to your investment portfolio. Masterworks is offering a lucky 25 people who sign up using our link a free one-year subscription to our Latin Politic newsletter, valued at $50. And as you already know, covers unique analysis of Latin American business and politics. Masterworks, the first and only art investment platform, allows investors to buy shares that represent an investment in iconic works by artists such as Andy Warhol, Cause, or Banksy. Here's how it works. The Masterworks research team analyzes over 60,000 data points to find financially attractive works that they believe will appreciate in value. Then, Masterworks acquires paintings ranging from $1 million to $30 million and securitizes them by filing a public offering with the SEC. No one can predict the future, and while past performances is not indicative of future results, contemporary art prices have appreciated in value by 14% for the last 25 years. In fact, contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500 total return by 164% from 1995 to 2001. Keep in mind that the art market is not as liquid as the stock market, so you may have to wait a while, maybe even years, until the painting is sold. Skip the waiting list though by clicking the link in the description. You can get started and manage your account all online. So go ahead and check it out. And as always, in everything related to investment, tread carefully. Nothing is risk-free. And now, let's get cracking. When we were pacifists. In 2018, Donald Trump threatened to pull the United States out of NATO. Had he followed through on his threat, NATO would have disintegrated at that point. And believe me, many other world leaders at that time would have celebrated. Around that time, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, went so far as to say that the state of NATO was brain dead. At the moment, I guess Macron will be wishing that no one reminds him of his own words. But you have to admit that. At that precise moment, Trump kind of had a point. You know that here on Visual Politic, we were always very critical of the Trump administration for good reason. But on this particular point, he gave an important wake up call. Almost no NATO members were meeting their military spending commitments. At the end of the day, why should they? They all knew that in the event of a real threat, they could always count on Uncle Sam's support. For example, in this graph, you can see Germany's military spending. If you look at the 1960s, Germany spent almost 5% of its GDP on defence. During the 1970s and 1980s, this expenditure went down to reach 2.56% by 1990. And just after 1990, that is when the Iron Curtain fell, it dropped dramatically to just over 1%. And the same trend can be seen in almost all other European countries. So now, the question on everyone's minds is, why did all the Europeans suddenly join hands and start singing John Lennon's Imagine while throwing their fate 
into the wind? Well, it might not be that exact question, but think about it. Why was NATO created? Why did the United States and Europe spend so much on armaments in the 1980s? It's quite simple, really, because there was a real threat in the Soviet Union. However, with the Soviet Union dissolved, why spend more on weapons? Make no mistake, Europe has had recent wars. Millennials watching this video have lived through at least one, the Balkans, a war in which NATO ended up participating. However, in the Balkan conflict, there was no superpower with nuclear weapons involved. The great traditional wars seemed a thing of the past. And after 9-11, the new number one enemy in the free world became terrorism. Suddenly, the bad guys in movies were no longer gentlemen like this one. They were more men like this one. Throughout the 21st century, all defense forums started talking about new concepts such as counterterrorism, cybersecurity, and hybrid warfare. Believe me when I say that this is not just our opinion. Check out this survey. Here you can see that the top military priority for Europe was North Africa, followed by, of course, the Middle East. Think about it. Fighting a gang like Al-Qaeda or Daesh is a challenge, but it is a cheap challenge. No need for aircraft carriers, no need for nuclear submarines, which is gear that is really expensive for the armed forces. In other words, very few thought that military spending was necessary. In fact, some even dared to say things like this. Pedro Sanchez. The Ministry of Defense is too large, and the budget against poverty is too little. That's right. For those of you who don't know him, Pedro Sanchez is the Prime Minister of Spain. And yes, it is true that he said those words back when he was still a candidate running for election. But it serves to illustrate the general sentiment throughout Europe. Over the past 20 years, European governments have not only reduced their military budgets, they have also used the military for tasks that have very little to do with actual defense. For example, in 2005, Spain created the Military Emergency Unit, which is a kind of fire department paid out for by the defense budget. And then there are entire units that have stopped training for combat and have moved on to humanitarian tasks. This is not a criticism of humanitarian work by any means, or indeed of first responders. You know that here on Visual Politics, we have a deep respect for the armed forces and the important work that they do. But the facts are clear. Almost all of Europe has treated defense as if it were kind of a joke. We have even seen outrageous proposals like this one towards a climate-proof security and defense policy, a roadmap for EU action. That's right. At some point, someone in Brussels came up with the idea that climate change should be a priority in the armed forces. Now, don't get me wrong. We are not saying that climate change is not important. It very clearly is. But in the case of war, I mean, really, take a second and imagine right now in Ukraine, someone is buying bullets for their machine guns and saying, hey guys, are these ones biodegradable? In other words, for more than 30 years, the whole of Europe was convinced that there would be no more war, which now kind of sounds sounds ridiculous. But let's be honest, it sounds ridiculous now that we have seen the invasion of Ukraine. If we had posted this exact same video just a couple of weeks ago before the Russian operation, many of you would have accused us of being alarmists. However, everything has changed. Putin has buried John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And how did he do that? Well, we're going to take a look at that right now. If you want peace, be prepared for war. We have said several times in recent days, Putin has already lost this war. No matter what happens in Ukraine, Vladimir Putin's broader goal was to end the NATO threat. For years, it looked like he was kind of going to get away with it. However, the invasion of Ukraine has changed everything. Check this out. Neutral Finns and Swedes reconsider idea of NATO membership. And that is just the beginning. The Baltic countries have already asked the United States to put military bases in their countries. And take note, it's not the United States that said, oh, hey, I would like to put some military bases in Estonia. It's been the Estonian government itself that has said, please put military bases here because we're afraid of being next after Ukraine. Germany, as we already mentioned, has said it's going to double its military spending. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has gone so far as to say that he wants to change the constitution to include defense spending of 2% of GDP. In other words, we have gone from listening to John Lennon to listening to Sam Sabaton. The question now, though, is who's going to pay for the concert? Because it's very easy to say, let's spend more on defense. But what does that actually mean? Buy more planes? Hire more soldiers? Well, let's see. German military still facing resources shortage. New report finds. The report we are talking about is not just any report. It is a report of the German parliament, which goes so far as to say that none of the German submarines and combat fighters are ready for, you know, combat. All of them are under repair or don't have fuel to operate. In other words, if Russia were to attack, there'd be no way to respond. At least not for several weeks.
And this is not unique to Germany. Almost all European armies have the same problem. What little weaponry they do have is stored in hangars. Why? Because maintaining a combat fighter to be combat ready is expensive, very expensive. And without money, nothing can be done. So this is very likely to be one of Europe's first priorities. Of course, new equipment purchases are also to be expected. Remember the F-35 fighter we've talked about here so many times on Visual Politic? Well, it looks like we will see many more F-35s in European armies. And make no mistake, this is not due to pressure from the United States. This is because after decades of meager budgets, Europe has few weapons companies to compete with the Americans. So as of today, if you want a state-of-the-art fighter jet, you have no choice but to buy the F-35. Now wait a minute, I know what many of you are thinking, especially those of you who have come to this video from the military affairs community, of which there are many of you. You're saying, finally, someone's listening. And yeah, you're right, but here comes the question that no one is asking yet. Where is all the money going to come to fund all this? Think of it this way. The list of urgent life and death priorities and existential emergencies in Europe is longer than ever. Two years ago, we had COVID-19, which translates into more taxes and more debt. The recipe for getting out of the COVID crisis has been the new green agenda to end the climate emergency, which means more taxes and more debt. Now, we also have the threat of Russia, which will translate into, you guessed it, more taxes and more debt. If we add to that the colossal inflation that we are already experiencing and will continue to experience in the coming months, we have a pretty bleak outlook. So the question is, what can be done? Well, here we go with an idea. Kill two birds with one stone. Why is there no European Google? We've asked this question a million times here on Visual Politic, and let's be clear, this is the problem for Europe. Without innovating and leading companies, there is no economic growth. And without a functioning economy, there is no social spending, no fight against climate change, and no defense. So the question is, why does Europe always lag behind in new technological revolutions? Some will say it's because Europe has very high taxes. But if we compare country by country, Estonia, for example, does not have higher taxes than California. Legal certainty? Well, Europe has legal certainty. One of the reasons for the lack of innovation in Europe Europe is the military. That's right, the army, or rather the low investment in the armed forces. Of course, it is not the only reason, nor perhaps the most important one, but it is still relevant. Think about it this way. Israel, South Korea, and the United States are technologically advanced countries largely thanks to their militaries. Silicon Valley was born thanks to, among other reasons, the fact that the military established a telecommunications development center right there. In fact, the internet was born as a US defense project. I know what many of you are thinking, really? Since when has the state been so able to effectively to promote R&D? We all know, basically every time a government wants to develop a particular technology, it kind of fails miserably. We see this happen all the time. For example, the European Union has the Horizon Europe program, which is dedicated to funding research projects. On paper, it's a fantastic idea, but you really don't want to investigate it in depth. I'll give you an example that we have seen personally here at Visual Politic. We're not going to name any names, but believe me when I tell you, this is a real case. In 2018, a university developed a system to create a biomass press. These are easy to build presses that would allow garbage to be compressed and turned into pellets that generate energy in a very efficient way. The research was even given a national award. So what's the problem? The problem is, it has been four years since the completion of the project. It remains to be seen if a biomass press based on the designs from the project will ever be built. Not even a patent has been taken out that another company could buy. It's a nice piece of paper sitting on a shelf somewhere in Brussels. After all, who's going to bother to turn this new technology into a really useful product for society? No one. No one has the incentive to do so. And there are thousands more examples just like this one. Military research and development, on the other hand, is very different. In this case, the states themselves have a very strong incentive to create weapons which compete with the enemy. So R&D is channeled mainly to applied proposals. Of course, there are also big cost overruns in defense research and development. There's the example of the F-35, which we've given a good account of here on Visual Politic. But even in that case, at the end, you get the most lethal fighter jet available right now. Is it expensive? Yeah, but it's a weapon that is unrivaled, at least as far as anyone knows. And many of the technologies that have been developed to create the F-35 will spawn a lot of startups for civilian use. Put it another way, spending on defense has a civilian utility. Therefore, it is not at all unreasonable that a large part of this new military spending will not come from new taxes, but from other expenditure items that were destined for civilian research. In other words, the same funds that now go to civilian projects may now go to military projects that, sooner or later, will have a civilian use. 
Let's put this another way. Military spending on innovation tends to be much more applied than other public research and development spending. This is precisely one of the reasons why Israel, with a defense expenditure of 5.6% of its GDP, is also the nation of startups. In this case, the military has served to galvanize innovation in other sectors. So when it comes to spending, military research and development can reach better results than any other option. And so now the question is over to all of you. Are we going to see new tax hikes in Europe to pay for military spending? Or will all this military spending come from other spending items? And to what extent can the threat from Russia be an opportunity for the emergence of a much needed European Google one day? You can leave us your answer in the comments below. As always, don't forget that here on Visual Politic we have new videos every week. So subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell button down there so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it so we know, and I'll see you next time.